something about flow metrics and uh, Kanban, right? So now a couple of things before we start the webinar. This webinar is a bit text heavy and because of the nature of the environment in which we work where everything is being done online, you know, I've, the content is a bit textual so, so you can keep a little uh, attention to the screen. Uh, it is intentional and this webinar is not about teaching you or certifying you on flow and this is not all this is also not to tell you which framework you should adopt for flow but this is more around you know understanding what is flow how to get started on your flow journey and what are some metrics that are suitable for certain situations like if you face a problem like what metrics are tracked better right and this webinar is about 55 plus slides i'm timing it around 50 minutes maybe plus or minus five or six minutes here and there so with that premise Let's get started on our journey. So what's our current understanding of flow, utilization versus flow, flow metrics and thoughts on metrics and reporting and a couple of other topics that will jump in as we go along, right? So uh, in a quick minute or two, right, let's talk about what is our understanding of flow. Let's go into a non-IT, non-software mechanisms, right? So what is our understanding of flow? For example, you know, we talk about flow in terms of a tap. Like there's water flowing in, in a tap and we want to talk about, you know, this heavy flow of water and so on and so forth, right? And uh, what do we do when we look at, you know, athletes performing on the field? We kind of look at them and we are jealous, right? They are in a state of flow, right? They flow. Their actions seem so smooth, so uh, jitterless that you feel like, wow, that's, that's very smooth flow. Poetry is what we call it, right? So, so we've, we, we've, we've had a fairly good sense of what is flow uh, very naturally. In the, in the outside world, uh, we have this person called uh, Mihaly Robert, who basically wrote the book called Flow, which is today very popular. We talk about it a lot. Um, and he basically, you know, he recognized this psychological condition um, and he called this as a, as a concept of flow. He called it as a mental state. You know, he, he said it's highly focused. And essentially, he calls it as being in the zone where, you know, you're high performing. Now, Mihaly's concept has, has in the past 25 years, expanded into many domains. Uh, people talk about uh, it in software, people talk about it in sports, people talk about it in business. So now that Mihaly's uh, theory has become very popular, we now go a little bit deeper into, okay, so that was flow. But again, what is flow? So flow means moving along in a steady continuous stream but in the context of knowledge work and IT and software what does flow mean right so being able to visualize and manage your flow is important to achieving faster and more consistent delivery now these are big words put together but how do you make it actionable how do you get it into action and that's what we'll focus on the next few slides uh, in this webinar right so visualization of work is basically every framework out there talks about this as you know as a very important uh, uh, dimension of flow basically you need to visualize your work but why is it important right so let's say in a discrete manufacturing system such as you know there's a car or car manufacturing line or a factory that produces uh, you know steel ingots it's very easy to imagine it because the activities are all very discrete there's a very specific set of activities done at every machine and then when it comes out of it, you have certain value added to it. And uh, this is, you know, you could do it ad infinitum, you could repeat it across multiple uh, machines till it gets out of the factory. And then essentially you have like a output per unit of time, like how many machines or how many parts I produce per unit of time. Now this is very easy to do this because every machine is machine, it does a set job and then it just passes on to another person, right? But software is not like that. Software is not that well defined software is not that predictable, then what happens in, in case of software, right? Software work, what, and what do we know about software work so far, right? We know that software work is mostly invisible. We call it knowledge work because work is hiding in invisible queues, okay? Sometimes it's a backlog, sometimes it's an email, sometimes it's a Slack message, sometimes it's a, it's a Jira comment, right? Knowledge work is constant discovery because every day you're discovering something new about the feature you need to work on or the feature that you're already working on. Knowledge work is often unpredictable because no two people can deliver the same piece of work in the same duration. High degree of variability, skill sets vary, same task, different time to complete for two different people. 
and most important point is the value added time in knowledge work is very difficult to quantify so the point is let's say that you're moving a ticket or moving a task from uh, say from your backlog to engineering say development right is the entire time the ticket spends in engineering a value add time or is it just waiting time or is it block time so how do you quantify you know this was the exact duration that it actually added value to me and that's very difficult to do and that's what we're going to see you know uh, is there a way we can do that is there a way we can quantify this to get to that flow state now here's a here's a very interesting you may want to unmute yourself right so here's a very interesting discussion so on the left you have a, a pretty jam-packed highway and on the right you have again a bunch of freeways and highways uh, but looks pretty sparsely populated right which one would you be preferring? Right. Why? The highway is consistent or like there are no much disturbances. Uh, you're saying because you see no vehicles on the road, you may go faster. Is what, what you're thinking? Yeah. And also the flow, we can see like, I mean, it's smooth. I mean, uh, there is no, there's no much disturbances or like not much of traffic, I can say. Right. But here's my question, right? But it would also mean that you may have to go longer distances on the right. Are you okay with that? This could be like, you know, a, a three or a four mile detour from the from where you need to go and you basically need to do a long circle back and come back. So would you still be willing to go the floor route or would you prefer waiting in the queue on the left hand side? I think right one still, at least I, I do prefer the right one. Yeah. Fair enough, right. Yeah. So the, the let's do a little bit deep dive into what's happening here, right? So on the left hand side where it's all packed out, right? Work is 100% planned out. You know, you know exactly what you're going to be delivering for the next three quarters. You know, it's all very well estimated. But the problem that comes with it is you have tight deadlines and timelines that have to be met. There is no room for slippage or errors. There is always what we call as a critical path of these items and work items that need to go through. If there are dependencies, that work has to wait. You have to wait for somebody else to come back and resolve your dependency before you get started, right? And work simply sitting in the system is also a delay, right? No, if nobody's working on it, it's getting delayed. And if you need any change in any of the work items, it's going to take a long time for anybody to respond because the engineer is already working on something else because you are an organization that's focused on 100% utilization. So everybody needs to be utilized 100% and needs to be occupied. So if they get a piece of work until they finish what they already have, they can't take up the next piece of work. So now what's happening, work is flowing very slowly through the system and everybody is busy. But are they producing outcomes? We don't know. Just like the, car, just like the cars in the previous example, right? The cars are all there. This is a 100% utilized road. I would say this is a 100% utilized road on the left. But what good is a 100% utilized road? It's nothing but a parking lot because nothing is moving on the right hand side on the other hand you have limited work planned everything is forecasted you have enough room for slippages and errors work is always moving due to limited work you obviously can respond faster because there are other people also available to respond to you and in case of dependencies because of adaptive capacity you can accommodate the changes and you can move on now, this seems like a no, very, this is like, a, like utopia, right? Like very ideal world. Where will I get a team like this? How can I work with a team like this? Right? But this is not difficult to achieve. That's what I wanted to bring up. This is not difficult to achieve. So on the left, your work controls you. And on the right, you control the work. And obviously, you know, you, you always want to control the amount of work in the system. You prefer having the control. Now, let's come back to a very interesting question, right? So what is stopping flow? So let's talk about this, right? What stops flow? Sudden changes in work priorities, right? Previously unplanned work, previously hidden work that has now become unavoidable. And the definition for that is technical debt. You have context switching. You're working on a story, then suddenly you jump to customer work, then suddenly you jump to technical debt. Size of your work also matters. You know, your stories are all not of the same size. Then there is a lot of discovery, business analysis, sales, customer success that is also involved in the life of developers slash engineers slash managers, which all of this is contributing to this, to this flow getting stalled. Now, the fun fact is there is only a finite amount of capacity that is available. 
be it a sprint, be it a week, be it a month. No matter what you do, there's only a finite amount of capacity that's available, depending on your team size, right? And you can notice this beautiful, uh, you know, diagram that's put together, right? Like I, I love this picture for this, right? So you have unmet business goals. So you kick off more projects. These projects conflict with other projects that we already have. These projects lead to more work in progress, essentially, basically leading to delays in completion. And then which again go back to, you know, your business goals are not being met. Very, very interesting uh, vicious circle there. So now we come to measuring flow, right? Now we come to the crux of why we are here on this on this webinar today, right? So if we have data, let's look at data. And if all we have are opinions, let's go with mine. This is a quote by Jim Barksdale, who, who was the former CEO of Netscape. Um, in case you, you don't know Netscape, you know, probably need to Google it up. But yeah, he, he, he was a very successful CEO who spoke about, uh, you know, uh, if you need to talk about uh, something, uh, if it's non-factual, then I'll prefer my opinion. But if it's factual, let's look at the data. So now let's look at the flow metrics. The first metric that I want to talk about is throughput, right? Everybody knows this one. The first three metrics, I think everybody knows, but we'll cover it, right? What's throughput? Throughput is nothing but number of work items delivered. And you say delivered, different people have different definitions of delivered. Here I mean completed. Means it, it has gone into production or it has reached the customer, right? So number of work items delivered in a period of time. And how have we captured it here? Basically, we are capturing it as number of uh, issues delivered, number of tickets delivered, right? So week one, some 10, week two, some seven and a half, eight, like X, so and so. So this, this gives a fairly good sense of the capability and stability of the team. So if you can notice, this team is consistently being able to deliver around between 10 to 15 stories or issues in a given period of time. Right? Seems like a fair ask. Now, this is great, but even this isn't accurate enough. So what we do is we go, we del, we break down this chart into something more appropriate, which is now we're looking at throughput by issue type. So you break down that chart into the different types of issues that were resolved. So now we get down to user stories, customer support bugs and technical debt. Right. Very good question. How is the sizing done, right? Are tickets and stories are of equal size? No, not necessarily. They are not. First chart, they are not. So in this chart, they are not. And in this one, we get to know what they are. We have still not established the fact whether they are the equal size or not. We are still looking at how many have you have delivered. That's all. We are not looking at whether they are sized or not sized. That's a, that's a slightly different discussion for a different metric. Right. Now, this is much better because now you have a fairly good sense of the stability of the team. Why? Because now you know this team is capable of delivering around seven to eight stories per week. This team is capable of delivering approximately 10 customer support bugs per week and about three to four technical debt stories per week. And that is a very good starting point to understand flow metrics. So now that we established throughput by issue type, let's go one level deeper. Now let's compare, okay, how different is throughput from velocity? Right? This question comes up quite frequently and I want to make sure that we understand this correctly. Right? Both throughput and velocity, they measure team delivery patterns. They also give you a sense of stability and predictability, but throughput is independent of work item size at this point in time. You can make it dependent on it. That's a different discussion. But at this point in time, throughput is independent of work item size. Throughput is not tied to a cadence. So you're not doing it like at a, every sprint, every every two sprints, every PI. You're not doing it. And the fun fact is, it's very, very simple to collect. There is no complexity. You know, you're just measuring how many work items are done. As simple as that. So with that, we move to the next flow metric, which is lead time and cycle time. Now, this lead time and cycle time is oft debated a lot, both inside uh, the Kanban world and outside the Kanban world. So we'll talk about it for a couple of minutes, right? So we are defining lead time as the time between an item is discovered until the time it is delivered. 
So discovery meaning from the time the customer has brought it up and it has found a place on one of your boards somewhere till the time it is actually delivered in the hands of the customer. And cycle time is basically defined as the time that has elapsed in the development cycle, the point where the team actually gets involved to pick up the story and do the actual development work. You can define that as a cycle time. Now the actual definitions of lead time and cycle time are different according to whichever method framework you use. And there is a reason for that. Um, Kanban University uh, Kanban courses focus on um, the time starting for lead time and for cycle time collection as the time the engineering team picks up the ticket. Whereas other frameworks, they pick it up from the time the customer has placed the order. So these are slight nuances between the various frameworks that we have out in the market, but essentially they all talk about the same thing, which is how much time has elapsed. Right. So now how, what good, what good is lead time and cycle time, right? So lead, lead time is basically, if you go by the popular industry definition, right? From the time the work item is discovered till the time the work item is delivered or released. So it takes into account everything. If you're waiting for someone to pick up your ticket, wait if the ticket is waiting among other queues, if, some, if this ticket is deprioritized, something else is put up, you know, blocked because of internal dependency, blocked because you're waiting on external team, all of it is measured under one bucket called lead time. And this is an excellent metric to make customer commitments. So an average lead time customer commitment is pretty decent. Now, okay, if this is lead time, then what is, then what do I do with customer lead time, right? So before we go there, let's look at the lead time in a slightly complex board. This board was pretty simple to do, sorry. This board was pretty simple. Let's look at a slightly complex board here, okay? You have this yellow sticky that moves from the backlog. It moves from the backlog to solutioning, from solutioning to architecture review, from there to proof of concept, from there to ready for development, then jumps to development doing, development done, validation doing, validation done, development deployment to UAT, uh, you know, product owner and customer sign off, deployment to customer development environment. Right? And on the right hand side, what I've done is I've posted a small table that shows how long the ticket has spent in each phase. So the ticket got created on day one. It moved to solutioning on day eight. Basically, it waited in backlog for about seven days. Then it moved to architectural review in day 11, ready for dev day 12. It moved to development doing on day 18, meaning it spent about six days waiting in ready for development and so on and so forth. So it takes about 50 days for the ticket from the time a customer has requested it till the time it reaches the hands of the customer. It takes about 50 days. Great. Now, this was just one ticket that we discussed. Now, if I were to look at all the stories and all the epics and all the features that were delivered in the past 60 days, how would that look like? So on the left hand side, what I have done is I have basically made a, a fictional uh, dump for you. So you see story number one delivered in 25 days, story number two delivered in 50 days, 45, 65, so on and so forth. So all these stories have got delivered in the past X days. And what I've done is I've calculated the average. So I'm saying on an average, the lead time is approximately 47 days. Seems fair enough, right? But there are a lot of tickets that take more than 47 days to get delivered. Yes, you can see that, right? You can see there are some six tickets here that take more than 47 days to get delivered, right? But what if the ticket that you commit to the customer falls into that above average one, right? Like if that's your luck where you get caught with the ticket that's going to take much more, much longer than your average ticket, right? Uh, which period do you use as a reference period for your average calculation? No, we don't. A good, very good question, right? So um, it depends, uh, it depends on two factors. One of them is uh, you're looking at an improvement time period. For example, you're saying this quarter is all I'm using for measurement. That's great because if you want to show quarter on quarter improvement, you could do that. Uh, if you are a team that has been practicing uh, this for from a long time, you probably want to ignore the metrics that were there at the beginning of your cycle because you know you have evolved, your process has become more stable, so it doesn't make sense. Choose that period according to your choice. What do you think would be best?
Now, in a system like this, if the customer asks you the question, right, when can I expect my feature? What would your answer be? So let's be approximately right instead of being exactly wrong. You see, I average is 47 days. That is true. Uh, right? So when do we usually complete X percentage of tickets where X is a high number? So here we're always, always remember that lead time is a post facto metric, meaning that you can measure lead time only after you have completed the activity, meaning only after the event has completed, can you actually measure it? Right? So when do we complete X percentage of tickets? where X is a high number, right? So I usually take 90% as my benchmark. So when do we complete? Usually complete 90% of the tickets. So in the past, we have delivered approximately 17 tickets. So 90% of 17 is approximately 15 tickets. So I arrange all these lead times in an ascending order. And then I look at when do I deliver the 15th ticket? So in this case, my 15th ticket is 65 days. So I am saying that I am 90% confident of delivering this ticket within 65 days. Remember that your average is still 47 days. Right. So between 47 and 65, you have a gap of approximately 18 days. Right. So if the customer wants more and more confidence, if he says, you know, I, I want you to be 98% confident, I want you to be 95% confident, or if you want to be 100% confident, then you need to adjust the metric accordingly. And obviously, the more data points you have, the greater the confidence with which customer commitments can be made. So now let's come back to the cycle time, right? Cycle time internally, when do we measure it? We measure it from the time the development team picks up the ticket and the time till they get done with it. Right? They have they have validated it and they have pushed it into the UAT environment or whatever is your criteria for definition of done for the development team. So this in this one, it exposes all your internal wait times. It shows where are your queues. It shows where are the dependencies. So this is a great way to build your processes. If you are looking at a very, very process focused transformation, then this is an excellent metric to start. Right. So you're now looking at, you know, within the development team. Okay. Uh, I'm waiting for three days for somebody to pick up the ticket and then he does his work or she does his work and then she passes it on to, you know, um, a queue where it's waiting for another seven days and then the testing team picks it up. And then, uh, you know, they spend two days understanding the ticket and then they spend three days testing the ticket and then they push it to a, uh, you know, a queue for deployment and then it waits there for 10, 10 days. All that is a very good uh, indicator of where you can process optimize within your teams. Right. So same example that we have, right? So you can look in, within, in, within development team, right? So a ticket goes from development doing to validate to deployment to PO and customer sign off and customer dev, you can see how long it takes, right? It takes approximately 35 days. And in these 35 days, the ticket is actually waiting for more than 31 days. If you notice it. So there is more weight than actual work that's happening on the board. Because the ticket is waiting for six days, then it's waiting for eight days, then it's waiting for five days, then it's waiting for eight days, and then another five days. Essentially, your, your, thir your 35 days is nothing but four days of work and 31 days of wait. Now, some of this, you can do both. Data collection can be done both manually and automatically. Uh, if you're looking at automatically, yes, I'll show you an example that I have put in place. Uh, we'll see that in a minute, right? So now let's look at what would that look like, right? Now, what I have done in one of my previous organizations is um, I have basically implemented a cycle time heat map. Now, I am not really talking about any tool here. Please understand that I want this to be a very tool agnostic session. We are not dependent on any tools. So in this case, you know, I have taken Jira work items and I essentially took a dump of the data and I basically built categories. I called, I basically said what would classify as an engineering cycle time, what would classify as a code review time, what would classify as a QA cycle time. And I went back and built a heat map. This is all on Excel sheet. Okay. From Jira, you download the data and then you can build all of these metrics on an Excel sheet. So now what we did was we went ahead and we told the uh, teams that we have established as an organization code reviews should not take more than 48 hours to complete. So essentially that means approximately three days not more than three working days 
a ticket should stay in code review and that became a driving metric for all the teams so you can see so before the transformation how it was and after the transformation how it moved you can see a lot of them are in the greens there are still a few reds but yeah that's essentially it so you could build it it's a very simple process you can all do it on your own uh, excel sheets uh, but if you do this it gives you good visibility into what's happening and we are just collecting the time the ticket has spent in a particular column that's all okay another way to visualize your cycle time would be you can look at the cycle time trend chart what is the uh, cycle how is the cycle time going so for example if if at all you're working in a team where there are tickets of varying sizes like you know and you're not able to like kind of stabilize you can look at this cycle time trend chart to find out what exactly is happening here for if if you're working with the items that are varying in sizes your cycle time trend chart would not go down it would be a very violent uh, you know a very erratic chart and that should give you a good sense of what you're doing wrong and if you are a team that has already established a process which is pretty uh, rock solid in terms of uh, 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 you know cycle time collection and cycle time tracking then this trend should technically be on a downward spiral because you're continuously making improvements and you're looking at the data and you're making uh, more changes so essentially this now how does lead time and cycle time help you right so lead time gives you a number or a predictability with respect to a customer demand item there's a customer request and it gives you a, a a fairly good sense of how do i make a commitment right and cycle time gives you a very good perspective on what are your internal processes and challenges right so we are getting closer to the value added uh, definition that we saw earlier in the slides right how am i adding value is all the time spent in adding value that question is going to get answered slowly okay now the third metric that we talk about is lead time inequality now don't don't really worry if it's if if it seems mathematical it's not really mathematical we are simply looking at how long does it take for us to deliver 10% of the tickets and comparing it with how long does it take for us to deliver 90% of the tickets now why is this a very interesting metric the reason for that is because this indicates how much your lead times are stretching so you have some tickets which you deliver within 2 days and you have some tickets you deliver within 10 days there are some tickets you deliver within 40 days now you are trying to measure a, how big is my spread how big uh, i mean how variable is my process so from 5 days and 10 days to 40 days that's a huge variation for a simple ticket uh, for a simple or rather for a process right for stories being delivered of course it is highly possible that you have stories and tasks of different sizes into it but essentially it, it gives you a uh, indication of whether you are on the right track or not so the smaller this ratio the smaller the ratio between the p10 and the p90 or the p95 metric the better it is for the system or the more predictable is the system so in this case the ratio is 3.5 it's a dimension it's a dimensional dimensionless metric meaning that you can't really assign days or you know uh, tickets to it essentially it's just an indicator of the spread and lower this number the better it is for the system or you are having a better system in your hand right we talk about one more metric within the same uh, gambit it's called the coefficient of variation now what do you mean by coefficient of variation essentially we are trying to find out how much is your kanban system or your uh, software system moving away from the average right it's a it's a measure of central tendency you can easily calculate it uh, using the number right you have your standard deviation of all your lead times you have the average of all your lead times and you divide your standard deviation by your mean and the lower this number is the better uh, or more predictable your system is this may seem like a little bit of math but it's not you can you can it's just a excel column you could just simply derive it right away then and there and a lot of tools that generate this for you today so so then we come to the fourth metric that i want to talk about which is called flow load 
So flow load is basically number of work items that are partially completed in the system. So all your work in progress in the value stream is basically a flow load. From the time a ticket is enters ready for development stage till the time it gets delivered to the done, all the tickets in 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 middle in the in between these two phases are work in progress. And this is not the VIP limit. Please don't confuse this flow load with VIP limit. VIP limit is different. VIP is basically all the work items in progress in the entire system. And this is a very good leading indicator. What do you mean by leading indicator? A leading indicator is something that allows you to catch something from happening upfront. A lagging indicator is something that you would know about only after the event has occurred. So in this case, a whip is a leading indicator, meaning that the moment you see these whips being high, you know for a fact that some metric is going to go for a toss. And there are two metrics that will go for a toss. One is your cycle time, other one is your throughput. So why cycle time will go for a toss? Because this, the, if the, the higher the whip, the higher time the work is going to uh, spend in the system. And the longer uh, you spend in the system, lesser will be the throughput. It's a vicious circle, which is why VIP is a very leading indicator. Now comes the point, right? Value added time versus, sorry, value added time versus total time spent in system. Very, very difficult to measure. And even in the example that I'm giving, it is not very accurate, but this is a very good start to approach the problem. Okay. So the question is, assuming that you have a, like a 40 day cycle time, where exactly are you adding value? And how do we basically uh, spend this time in the system, right? So we are exposing the inefficiencies in the system. So if you look at here, dev ready is waiting, development is working, development done is waiting, test ready is waiting, testing is working, UAT is working, delivery ready is waiting, right? So if you look at this, so if I were to calculate flow efficiency, how would I calculate value added time by total time spent in the system? Now, in this case, the, in the previous example that we that we saw, uh, all the time spent in working, in development, ongoing, in testing, and UAT, that alone I will calculate as my value added time. And everything else I will basically categorize as lead time. Now, this will help you leverage uh, or rather initiate conversations around value stream mapping. If you have not already done that, you could do that now. And it will help you drive decisions on prioritization. Can, we, can I prioritize this? How do I capacity utilize this? Because you're now trying to find out where do I actually add value. And even within development, uh, so let's look at this example. Right? So development ongoing, not all the time the ticket spends in development ongoing is value add. So we are not going down to that level, but this is a very good start to identifying flow efficiencies. Then we come to the sixth metric called flow distribution. Now, how different is flow distribution and throughput, right? Now, flow distribution, throughput is simply number of items work, it, uh, work items delivered, right? Now, flow distribution is all about different types of work items that are being delivered. What is their, uh, what is their demand, right? What is their spread looking like? So, for example, uh, you know, you're, you're delivering 10 features, 8 defects, 2 unplanned work, 6 technical debts. Right? and about eight change requests. And you can start looking at it at on a monthly basis. In January, you delivered these many features, these many defects, these many unplanned work, February, March. So why are we doing this? You're looking at different, is this from throughput, right? So here the focus is on the demand and the inbound work items. What is the demand that's being placed on your system? Are we focusing on the right mix of work items? Like are we, over prioritizing stories and are we like kind of ignoring the bugs so that when the release happens, the bugs get priority? Are we hedging our risk by making sure we have the right mix of stories and bugs all packed together? Are we doing only one type of work? Right? All of these questions will help you address this question of flow distribution. This is an equally important metric. So you avoid overloading the team. It will de-risk your delivery because you are not delivering only one work item type over a long period of time. You are revealing your hidden work item types. Sometimes this is an urgent request. This is coming from the marketing team. This is coming from the CEO's desk. How are you categorizing all that? You know, And how do you explain for all those work items eating into your existing capacity? 
So if you use slow distribution in tandem with lead time, it will help you make a very confident commitment to the customer. The last, one of the last items that I have is, this is a penalty mid item, the work item, aging. Um, we all know aging analysis, we all know that, you know, the longer the work item type spends. What we have, what I've done here is, I've tried to define something a little bit uniquely, and I use this, I use this mostly for, um, I use this mostly for uh, identifying items at risk, right? So for example, if you look at this, right, uh, the y-axis or the vertical axis is the number of days the work item has spent in the system and the x-axis is basically work item ID. So in this case, you know, they're all same work item type, all stories you're comparing. And let's say there's an average date time of 10 days. So you know all these green items that you're trying to see on the screen, they're all of the same nature. You know, they're all getting closed and open at the same time. So you don't really worry about it much, right? But then there are tickets who's, who are in the system for longer than the average lead time. So then they become a zone, they become a concern item for me. The question, the question that I have is why is there a delay in delivering these work items? Why, if, uh, why is there a delay in delivering these work items? Because they have already exceeded the average lead time. So there must be something wrong with this. So why, why is there a delay? And second most important point is, is it really important? Did we commit to it unnecessarily? Like why is it on our board and we're not looking at it? Why is it on our board and we're not resolving this issue? So this is a very interesting metric. I, I look at it as a chart. Work item aging, you can get it from any tool in, in, in today's market, but you need to look at it in this context, like a chart. Like where you have the average lead time, you have a 90 percentile lead time, and then you have a zone of concern where you know that you're hitting the limits. So why do we need uh, so why do we need work item aging for the, for the following? Now we move to the last metric that I want to discuss, which is about flow safety. How are we protecting and enriching flow? Now this metric is not a, uh, a derived metric. This is more of an applicable applied metric. I'll explain to you how this is done. So here we are for ensuring that the work keeps flowing through the system, and the people in the team have that safety to basically suggest actions to protect that flow, right? So you can run a small survey that you can run at a cadence like every three weeks, every four weeks, or you can run this during retrospectives. And this varies from team to team. Showing you a small template of what I do in my teams. So there is flow safety for the team where we have a, a few sample questions. As a team, I'm aware of the customer in outcomes and the impact. As a team, we trust failures as learning opportunities. And you, you get the team to rate it on a scale of zero to five. Similarly, uh, on the on the individual side, we also say as, as flow safety as an individual, I am not afraid to mark tickets as blocked and express my concerns. I feel safe as an individual with the voice within the team and my voice is heard. I have freedom in, in questioning pull decisions and priority of tickets and things like that. Right. So these are some uh, metrics that I capture. And this is more like a report card of sorts that basically tell me uh, are we feeling feeling safe enough to flow? Are we feeling, uh, you know, this is a psychologically safe team where we can get things done? Okay. So now comes the question, right? When to use what metric? Again, I want to make sure, uh, just make a very cl clear disclaimer. I'm merely suggesting, okay, your mileage may vary, but this is what I usually do. If work items are taking too long to deliver, um, I look at throughput, lead times, and work item aging. If I feel like if people are complaining about being overburdened and burnt out, I look at flow load and flow distribution. If the field teams are not fixing the right kind of stuff, like the technical data items and stuff, and you know they say we all you're always you're always prioritizing the product, I look at flow distribution. And the team feels a lack of trust is coming in, then flow safety is a metric that I would look at. Why do metrics and reporting fail? Why does it fail, right? Like for many reasons, one of them is we are tracking work in different, different places, in different, different forms, right? So you have epics, you have requirements, you have spreadsheets, project managers who are using Gantt charts, traffic light charts, timesheets. Then you have developers who are looking at features, defects, stories. Then you have testers, test cases, definition of done. Then you have operations team that has SharePoint, incidents, problems, vulnerabilities, change requests, all of them using their own separate tools. Right? 
So one important factor in all of this is the tool fights and incongruence in measurements. Right? Are we all measuring the same thing? Are we all measuring using the same tools? Are we all looking at the same data? Right? How are we sharing data and metrics across the organization? How do we understand capacity? How can we improve the flow of work? All of these are questions that need to be answered or, or we need to have the answers to these questions if we do not want the metrics and reportings to fail. So when I say fail, what do you mean by that? Right? We collect metrics, we present them and then no action happens. We collect metrics, we present them and then the semblance of action and then that enthusiasm dies down. And sometimes, you know, entire tools are disbanded. So for metrics, a few considerations. Um, a failure must initiate inquiry, not blame. Uh, leadership must be open to hearing bad news. If this is not the case, then uh, please do not get into uh, transformations. Uh, failures are learning opportunities. Messengers are not attacked. Team members trust one another and believe that everyone is working in the best interest of the team. Few more considerations. If you had to improve one metric, how will that one metric impact the other metrics that you're capturing? And how will you identify that you're focusing only on one metric and that you're not like over optimizing one metric while sub optimizing other metrics? And how would you know when you should start focus of focusing or prioritizing any one metric? And how will you know improvement has started? If you don't have answers to these questions, don't get into metrics tracking or metrics optimization yet. So remember that friction disrupts flow um, and this is a, I, love, I love this diagram because it clearly says, you know, um, it, it's all circles and <laughs> each one is at one different in di direction, right? You have personal interest, then you have emotion and stress, you have complexity and you have a chaotic environment and the center of all of it remains human limitation. There are limits to what a human being can do with limited knowledge, independent agents, unpredictable events, imperfect information. External actor, actors, different agendas, different interpretations, different priorities, noise, right? And in all, in midst of all of this, you're expected to run flow. Uh, 